Welcome to this series on JavaScript. In this first video, we're going to take a moment just to talk a little bit about what JavaScript is and how it's interpreted by your browser. And uh, we'll look at a quick example as well, and then we'll go ahead over to the browser and just inspect the page and take a look at the source code and see how and why JavaScript works in the browser. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm not going to set up a document or anything like that with a doc type and a head. I'm just simply going to go ahead and I'm going to type in uh, a script script tags, which we'll look at in the next video. Um, so I'm typing script tags here and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create an alert here. And what this is going to do is it's basically just going to bring a pop up window inside of the browser with just an OK button just to get rid of this. So I'm just going to type here, hello. Now if I head over to my browser and I refresh, you can see that it says the page at localhost because I'm working on a local server. You can do these examples throughout the series within files on your desktop or just files within your document area on your computer. You don't need to be running a server for this because JavaScript is a client side language. Uh, everything's interpreted and run in the browser and it's compiled within the browser and then run. So you don't actually need a server to be able to work with this. So you don't need to upload anything. You can get started straight away by just creating a file and just working with that file as long as everything that you write is valid it will work so you can see that we've got a hello dialog up here with an OK button I'm gonna go ahead and hit that and we're back to where we started now I'm gonna go ahead and view the page source here now you can see the entire source code of this file you can see that we've got the alert there with the hello text in the middle of it the script tags on the outside everything that we write in JavaScript will be visible to the users that are using the website so be wary that when you are perhaps including any sensitive information if you are writing anything that you wouldn't want anyone to see, be careful because anyone can see this, whether it's an external file or you're writing it just on the page like you can see at the moment. So let's go ahead and take a look at what actually happens uh, within the browser at this point. So what's happening is when we refresh, the page is being hit and you can see that within our body at the moment, you can't see, well, well within the head, this is automatically being sort of placed in the head because we have no, no structure. What's happening is when I refresh, this dialogue is being uh, induced and then when I hit OK, the rest of the code will be run. So this is called a synchronous command, if you like, because what's happening is it's blocking anything else happening on the rest of the page. You can see that we've got this sort of circular loading within Chrome here. Uh, when I go hit an OK, the rest of the code will be run. Now we can demonstrate this just by putting another alert underneath. So I'll type in there, for example. So we've got hello there within two different dialogues. Now when I go ahead and run this, you'll see we get hello first. There's no uh, existence of this other alert. It's just hello. When I go ahead and click OK, then we get this there box appear. So that's just an introduction of how this works within the browser and what it is. Um, browsers say Chrome has a JavaScript engine. Uh, Chrome has an engine called V8, and this is just how the JavaScript is being processed and run or executed, if you like. And different browsers will have different engines that they use to compile and execute the JavaScript and display it to the user. And this is really important because when you are working with cross browsers, you have to really make sure that everything is working perfectly in each browser that you develop for. So let's say we're just supporting Chrome, Firefox and Internet Explorer they have different JavaScript engines. So what's going to happen is, is that you're going to need to make sure that in each browser, the code that you're writing works the same. Um, because chances are that you'll get to a stage where, particularly in older Internet Explorer versions, your code might not work. Now, you may choose not to support these browsers, but you also need to think about future as well. So you need to think about future browsers. Now, don't worry too much about this because we're going to be going through the very basics of JavaScript just to get you up and running with knowing how to build applications and understand other people's code. But it is useful to know that you can then go on to work with libraries such as jQuery 
which allow for a seamless cross-browser experience. So we have particular JavaScript libraries that help us write code by doing all the hard work in the background for us. And we can just go ahead and use these libraries. And we'll be looking at how we use these libraries a little bit later on in the series. We'll have a sort of introduction to how we might go ahead and implement them on our page and exactly what's going on on the page as well. So that's a little introduction to JavaScript. It's running in the browser. You can go ahead and you can create a file that allows you to write this code in there. For example, the file that I'm working with is just this index file here. You can go ahead and create this file on your desktop, in your document area, it really, really doesn't matter. Go ahead and create a file with an HTML extension, load it into your browser, load up the file that you're working with in your text editor, and you can go ahead and you can start writing out code. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to want to do if we want to write JavaScript within a page is uh, implement script tags. Now, there are lots of different ways that we can actually uh, introduce JavaScript into a page. We have an inline uh, way of writing code, and this is usually based on event handlers. So um, we'll take a look at the three different ways that we can actually write JavaScript, and we'll explain why inline code isn't very good, and we'll explain why perhaps just script tags aren't very good. And then we'll look at the benefits of loading in external files that we've included JavaScript on. So let's go ahead and take a look at our page structure. So if you're not, not quite used to HTML, um, this will help in terms of the structure of your page. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to code up a very basic structure to this page. So I'm going to include a doc type, an HTML5 doc type, an opening and closing HTML tag, a head and the body. Now in the head, I'm going to go ahead and just introduce a title here. And I'm just going to call this JavaScript. Okay, so now all of the JavaScript code that we write isn't going to go in the head, you might have typically found that in the in the past, you'd have seen uh, JavaScript code being placed in the head of the page. Now, sometimes this is necessary, but most of the time you want your JavaScript to load after the, the markup on your page has loaded. Now, that doesn't mean implementing your JavaScript down here. It means implementing your JavaScript at the very end of the body. So let's just say we have some body content. I'll just go ahead and place a paragraph in here. This is a web page. So let's go ahead and take a look at this in the browser. You can see that the title of the document has changed and you can see that this paragraph element has been implemented onto the page. Now let's go ahead and introduce a link here as well. Okay, so I'm going to set the href to hash. Now, the first thing that we're going to take a look at in this video is how we implement JavaScript inline. Now, just before I start, this is not the way to go ahead and write JavaScript. You, will, you may have seen this before if you've come across little snippets of code, and it looks something like this. So let's say we want the user to click on this link and it pop up an alert. So I'm going to go ahead and type on click equals, and then I'm going to say this is called an attribute, and this is saying that everything inside of here will be run when this element is clicked and everything inside of here is JavaScript code. So let's go ahead now and type in alert and then we'll go ahead and type in what we want to alert. So you clicked me. So what's happening here is the element will be loaded onto the page like this. When I click it, you'll see that the JavaScript code is run within that block. Now there are several reasons why this isn't the best way to go ahead and write code. Let's say you wanted uh, a fair few things to happen when you click this link. Now you could solve this with the use of a function, which we'll be looking at later. But what you're actually doing is you're introducing clutter onto your page. Now when you write markup, you should be writing markup to separate 
the markup from first of all the presentation which will be your CSS styles and secondly separate it from your logic your application code so your JavaScript because that's the, the 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 code that runs within the browser so you want to try and separate this content as much as possible by by doing this you're mixing it up is exactly the equivalent of using things like the style element to go ahead and say you want the color of this paragraph to be red for example so it's exactly the same concept as mixing CSS styles in with your markup, which you don't want to do. Now, not only does this clutter your page and make it hard for developers to work on, the second thing is that you're actually introducing a slower page load time. And in this case, this would be, you know, unnoticeable. And in usual cases, it's unnoticeable. But what you're doing here is you're loading your entire page along with your JavaScript. And what this is doing is it's introducing more code for the page to load as it renders the HTML. So what's happening here is we're loading down the page, loading down the page. We hit this bit here as instead of just rendering a, a link, which we should be doing, and then setting our event handler, which is this on click thing here later on, we're actually going ahead and we are... Um, you know, we're loading the JavaScript along with the markup, so it's it's slowing down the page load time, particularly if you've got a lot of information here. Now, some people might argue, well, I could just go ahead and introduce a function here. So, uh, say hello, for example, and we would define the function lower down our page. There's still no point in doing this because what you're doing is you're cluttering your markup, you're mixing your presentation or your markup with your um, logic, and uh, it's again introducing more markup for the page to load so we don't tend to do it this way so now that we've got the web page back to its standard thing this click me doesn't do anything but what we can do is down here we can introduce things called script tags and this is just an opening script tag and a closing script tag and all of our code goes in between these tags so for example we could target this element and we could go ahead and we could set an event handler and alert something out. Now for now, all I'm going to do is just create an alert down here instead of going through the uh, process of teaching event handlers. We'll be looking at that later on. When I refresh the page, you see that we get hello. Now the important thing to note here is what's actually happened is the entire page has loaded. So the markup has been loaded. Then the JavaScript kicks in. So the JavaScript kicks in at the end. And this helps because it allows the markup to be loaded and then event handlers to be bound and anything else that you need your application to do. Now that's the second way of doing things. But what is actually happening here is you are including this on this page, which isn't allowing this code here to be cached. And let's say you had quite a large amount of code that you wanted to put inside the, the script tag. Well, that would it would make sense to go ahead and separate it. So once that file's been downloaded, when you visit that page again, the file is cached. So it's basically stored in the browser's cache, ready to just be used again rather than downloaded again by the server. And what this does is it saves, first of all, the user having to download the file again and again and again, or rather just have it on the page and download all this extra code. Um, and it also allows the uh, server not to have to serve this file again because the browser won't be requesting it. It's already cached. There's no change to the file. So what we're going to do now is we're going to include the same code here, but I'm going to go ahead and modify these script tags slightly. And by doing that, I'm just going to say script source equals and then something. Now what I'm going to go ahead and do is create a new file with the code in here. So I'm going to go and type hello. Now there's no reason at all to include script tags like this within this external file. You do not need to do this at all. The reason you don't need to do this is because what's happening is um, this code is being sort of implemented within this script. So it doesn't, you don't need to do that. So this file, I'm going to go ahead and save it. I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder just to store all of my JavaScript files in. And I'm going to call this alert.js. So what I'm going to do is head over to my index.html page and I'm going to choose the file location that I want to include, which is js forward slash alert.js. 
Now what's happened is we are achieving exactly the same effect, but what we're doing is we're externally loading in a file. And we can check this by bringing up the um, developer console within Chrome, or if you're using a, a browser like Firefox, it will be Firebug or, or, or Firefox's um, uh, developer tools. And you can see here that when we refresh, we still get this, and then you'll see that it, within the body here, we've got this external script file. If we head over to the network tab, you can see that we've got this alert.js file, and if we click on it, we can get a preview of this, and it's loaded in, so we can see the preview of it. Now, what happens if I want to go ahead and refresh again? You can see here that we get a 304 status back, not modified. And this basically means that this hasn't had to be downloaded again from the server. So like I was talking about earlier, this file hasn't been modified, so it's cached. It's cached within the browser. So whenever we refresh, we get this not modified here. Now what happens if I go ahead and I change this to hello there? When I go ahead and refresh now, you'll see that this says OK, because this file has had to be downloaded again, and we saw just a moment ago there the, the alert with the new text in. And what this means is that the uh, browser has seen that the file um, needed to be re-downloaded, it was changed, uh, the file size had changed, and it, or something had changed, and it needed to be re-downloaded. So it re-downloaded the file, and then it gave us the new hello there alert. And again, this is not modified now. So it's useful to understand how this works and how the script, different types of script tags work. The general rule is do not use inline, um, inline code. There's no need to use inline code in the majority, 99.9% .9 of circumstances. Avoid using script tags just plonked on the page and writing code out always separate your code into external files and if you can try and include them all in one file you might find that things tend to get messy if you had lots of different scripts down the page with files all doing different jobs now the benefits of this are you could separate them into different pages so one page might just have its own specific javascript another page might have its other uh, might have uh, javascript specific to that you might have a general primary um javascript uh, script that works for all, all sort of everywhere in your site so you might have maybe a primary one and then uh, a page specific one um you might even want to go ahead and um, have a single file that's automatically generated when you launch your site. So it might combine all of your JavaScript dependencies into one file. That's not too much to worry about now because if you're learning, you just want to go ahead and write the code. That's absolutely fine. But for now, it's a good idea to understand that the script tags should be included at the bottom of your page and they should be included uh, externally. Now there are some circumstances where you need to include code at the top of the page. And an example, a good example is, uh, for example, Google Analytics. Now what this is, is it's uh, analytics software provided by Google that allows you to track visitor information to your website. And the reason this needs this snippet of code needs to be included at the head, um, it will be something like this, so script, and then you'll have the code within here um, is because when the user lands on the page Google needs to start the script off straight away to start doing things on the page for things like uh, the time a user's been on the page so it's critical that that code is loaded first and you might find that you when you're developing a site you have code that needs to be run first but in the majority of cases if your code can be run at the bottom your markup can be run first always do it that way it will speed up the load time of a page for a user and it provides a much better experience in this video we're going to look at alerts confirms and prompt boxes in javascript now these aren't very commonly used anymore because there are more elegant solutions to be able to first of all collect data and display data to your user but it's worth knowing that they're there and it's worth understanding how they work and the synchronous nature of them so we'll be looking at each uh, one and we'll be just going through and looking at how they work and, and creating some if statements and, and seeing what we can do with this.
because we might be using them later on in some examples to just collect quickly collect data from users so we can manipulate them and then tell users certain things. So the first thing is one that we've already seen and this is an alert box. Now the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to create an external file for this tutorial. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a script tag with an external source and that's going to be um, boxes.js. I'm just going to call these boxes and refer to them as boxes. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file and save this in the JavaScript directory, so boxes.js. And um, that's it. I'm not going to write any markup on the page or anything like that. We'll do everything now within boxes.js. And you can see if we head over to our browser, um, we have just a blank page and we can see that the script is included in here. So what we're going to do now is look at a basic alert. Now this is a synchronous item that pops up and uh, forces the user to click OK. Then the rest of the code can execute. They're not the most user friendly things to use, but they do have their place uh, sometimes. So we've already seen these. This is just the alert function. So we call this function with a parenthesis and we put the parameter as the string that we want to display in here. Now what we can actually do is we can actually include line breaks, so we'll just take a look at that in a moment. Um, when I go ahead and refresh, you see that we get the page at localhost, which is the server I'm currently working on, says hello there. Okay, so when I click OK, the rest of the page runs and loads and, and we're all good. Now if I wanted to include a line break here, I can do. I just do a backslash N and then I go ahead and say new line, for example. And what this is this this control character will do is it will um, allow the, the sort of new line to be placed without having to use any markup or anything like that. So it's basically a line break. So it's useful to know if you do need to line break within an alert. So that's an alert box. Now that's probably the most simple. What we're going to look at now is we're going to look at a confirm box. And we're also now going to sort of delve into variables and if statements and things like that. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a variable which stores a true or false value. Now true or false values are booleans. So when I go ahead and create this variable, I'm just going to say var c equals confirm. Now beforehand, all we did was we did alert here. What we're now doing is we're storing the confirm answer, which is either yes or no true or false inside this C variable. So we're going to say confirm. Um, are you sure? So let's take a look at what this does. So when I go ahead over to the browser and refresh, it says, are you sure? OK or cancel. So basically, yes or no. If I click cancel, nothing happens. If I click OK, nothing happens. But what has happened now is the variable that we saw here now holds a value true or false. So what we can do is we can go ahead and we can work out what has been um, entered here. Now I can go ahead and alert C. Now remember not to include a string around this or you'll literally output the character C. If you just go ahead and alert C, you'll see that when I click OK, you get true. And when I click cancel, you get false. So what we could now do with this confirm box is we can use an if statement. And what this will do is it will check if C is true or false. So we can say if C alert, you are sure. Else alert, you are not sure. So now what's going to happen is it's going to actually alert something that we want it to alert based on what we click. So when I click cancel, you are not sure. And when I click OK, it says you are sure. So this is a confirm box that you can use to base an action within these blocks on an answer that's given to your user, whether that be OK or, or, um, or cancel. Now the third type of sort of box we're going to look at is a prompt box and it's basically used for input of um, information from a user. So again I'm going to say var but this time I'm going to say name equals and I'm going to use the prompt function. So not the alert, not the confirm, the prompt function. P 
please enter your name. Now, all we're going to do with this is we're going to say um, if, in fact, let's take a look at the actual prompt box first before we do anything with an if statement. Here we go. It says, please enter your name. So I can go ahead and enter my name and click OK. Now, the, the, the same thing has happened here as the last time, but na name now holds a string value based on uh, what I've entered into there. Now, if there's no value, this will be null. So we can go ahead and sort of investigate this by typing alert name. So let's go ahead and say refresh. Now, this is stopped at this point. Remember, it's a synchronous um, item or a synchronous piece of code, which means that the alert box that we have written next won't be run until this has uh, finished. It's a blocking operation. So when I type in Alex, it says Alex. So we've alerted out the name variable which holds Alex. What we can also do is enter nothing, which says nothing here. And that's actually a null value. So what we can do is we can say if name doesn't equal null alert hello space and we concatenate on name now we'll be looking at this a little bit later but what we can now do is refresh type in alex hello alex refresh type in nothing and oh it says hello so let's take a look here um ah it will be an empty string then so when i go ahead and refresh there we go. So I've typed in nothing. And uh, I think this is only if you click cancel, it'll say hello null, you see. So what we need to really do is perform two checks here. But that's not too uh, important right now. We're just sort of looking at the, the prompt side of things. Okay, so that concludes with um, the boxes introduction of sort of alert prompt and everything like that they're not commonly used and they're probably more elegant ways to do things as in terms of markup on the page to take data but sometimes they do have their uses so it's just good to know that they're there and how you can use and manipulate them now in this video we're going to look at a better way to output and inspect and do things with information that we have on the page now, because JavaScript is um, works client side, we can actually access things client side from the browser, and we can also use a um, better way of actually logging information, and that is to the console. Now, we've already seen the um, inspect element in Chrome, and we've looked at the dev tools, so um, we've seen this sort of element here that come that sort of bundles with Chrome we can go ahead and inspect um, items on the page elements on the page look at the network tab to see our external JavaScript resources being loaded in however there is a more useful way of dealing with this when we work with JavaScript or dealing with our code so let's go ahead and just write some on-page code with some script tags we won't bother using an external uh, script for now now Let's just say I create a variable called name and I'm going to call this Alex. So this is a string value here. Now what happens if I am on a page like this and I somehow need to know what value this holds. Now at the moment I can obviously see what value this holds. I know what value name is. However, if this was um, something that was unknown being a variable that can change, I might want to go ahead and log this value to the console. And instead of using an alert box, which is incredibly annoying when you're trying to develop a, a JavaScript application, you don't always want synchronous alert boxes popping up and blocking the next thing from running. So what you can do is instead of using alert name, you can use console.log and then whatever you want to log, whether it be a string, a boolean, an integer, any variable or any string that you just want to directly pass to it. You can even pass arrays and objects, which we'll be looking at later. Now, when I go ahead and refresh the page now, you can see that this code's updated. But if, it, if I head over to this console tab, you can see that this value has been output. So this, we know that this value is Alex now because we've output it to the console. 
What we can do also do is we can choose this little button down here, which we can show the console as well as our code. So we can be looking at things and also keeping an eye on the console as well. Now, the other useful thing about this is if, for example, this was a um, prompt, and I was to type in, are you sure? When I go ahead and refresh, um, oh, sorry, not a prompt, a confirm. Are you sure? And I hit OK, you can see here that we've logged true to the console. And when I click cancel, you can see that we log false to the console. So we can do this kind of thing. We don't need to use alert boxes or anything like that. Now let's get away from this example and let's look at um, an example. For example, um, let's create two numbers. So number equals five and number, we'll say number one, number two equals 10. Now what we can do is we've got these variables um, there within the browser. The browsers now store these as global variables. So we'll be looking at talking about global variables and everything like that a bit later. But if we have these two variables here, we can actually manipulate them using the console. You know, this isn't, they're not set in stone. We can, we can manipulate these using the console. Let's say I just want to get the value of number one. I can go ahead and just type in number one. And you can see that we've got a bit of an autocomplete there. So whenever I type number one and hit enter, that gives me the value of number one. I can do exactly the same with number two, and it gives me the value of number two, so 10. What I can also do is I could say number one plus number two, and that gives me the operation. So I, it tells me that number one and number two added together is 15. I can do exactly the same with minus, which will give me minus five. I can do the same with times if I want, and I can even do the same with divide. I could even concatenate them together. So I could say number one plus string plus number two is five and 10. And that gives me a string value back because I've concatenated it with a string. So we can do anything we want within the console and we can actually manipulate and see items that we sort of have within our code and we can play around with them here. What I could also do is I could say number one equals 10, which gives me back 10. It's sort of confirming that that value is now 10. Then I could say number one plus number two. Now, what do you think the answer will be here? I've changed number one to 10. So I've done that sort of on the fly dynamically. So now we have number one equal to 10, number two equal to 10, and that will give me 20. So until the page is refreshed, number one and number two are 10. Now they've changed back to five and 10 because I basically run the code that's already on the page again. Now we can use the console to write any JavaScript code we want, as complex as we want, or as simple as we want. So this is very, very simple stuff, but it's really good to know that the console's there to manipulate values on the page. We can log to the console if we need to see particular values within our code. We can inspect arrays, we can inspect objects, we can do whatever we want with this with the console. It allows us to really get an insight into our code and see what we want to do and manipulate things. We can even go ahead and create variables on the fly. So for example, I could say number one equals 24. And then I can say var name equals Alex. Now I have a variable called Alex. They're like this, so not var. Name equals Alex. Now I can say um, console.log, well, I don't really need to say console.log, but I could say um, name is number one. What that will do is it will now use the variable that I created and the variable that I changed to create a string. And now it says Alex is 24. So logging to the console is, is a really, really useful way of doing whatever you want in, uh, in JavaScript and sort of seeing what you want to see. So I could even say here result equals number one plus number two. And I can go ahead, refresh the page 
and I could say result, which will give me the result, or I can go ahead and do that within my code and I can say console.log result, which will automatically, when I refresh the page, log that out to me. So instead of using alerts to go through and debug your code and, and look at what values are what, use the console, play around with the console. Don't be afraid to mess anything up because at the end of the day, you can just refresh the page and start again.